Well, I have a little joke in my family that my parents, whatever problems they had in their life, they tried to solve it with architecture. Architecture and architects can offer solutions to problems that appear to be outside of their direct area, and specifically this uh, the whole issue of um, sustainability is exactly their business. And I would like to see architecture putting its hand up and saying, hang on, we'll sort these cities out. The 20th century is extraordinary. At the beginning of the 20th century, you could, we gave ourselves entitlement to do anything um, and we, with enthusiasm, you know, throw the local people off the land, chop down every tree, flood every little rapid boat. Fantastic! How exciting! And then at the end of the 20th century, we couldn't do a thing. You know, there's a snail <laughs> or something. And we, so we'd gone completely from thesis to antithesis. In our, and I think we needed to, because we'd, we'd turned this place into a, into a green desert. You know, we flattened all of that primeval forest on any decent land. So we've had this sort of stop, wait. But now we've got to get to the next thing. And, and I'm really optimistic that technology will mean that the, or everything else we, we do now, and especially wind, which is very exciting, I think, is going to mean that we can have a much lighter impact. I'm really excited by um, architecture that puts people at the, at the centre of, of the process. I would love Auckland to be a city that we were proud of the built environment, as proud of the built environment as we are of the natural environment. People talk again and again about Auckland, they go on about the harbour and the volcanic cones, but there's almost this idea, this unconscious idea, that there's no possibility that the built environment could be any good. I think Wellington's an amazing city. Physically, it's an extraordinary city. Just driving around those hills and Kandala and things, those crappy little houses, but the spaces in between them and the harbour and the... I mean, it's an extraordinary place. We need one absolutely extraordinary building, I think, in New Zealand to, to focus the mind that, 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 that it's possible. I think about this because in, in New Zealand culture, I think the architect still has and has long been considered some kind of fancy um, in, uh, luxury, you know, that you can't have. This is the culture where you, you need another milk and shed, you, you whip it up, mate. Colour in ar- architecture, from the photographer's point of view, is useful. It can be as dramatic as form and is a, is a great thing to work off. But the architectural photographer does need to work with their raw material. I mean, firstly, which is light, and the light in this country is extraordinary. It's very hard and intense and concentrated and dramatic, and um, it creates a lot of technical challenges around contrast, but it can make for really dramatic, uh, saturated colour if, if, if it's there. You can generally rely on Pete Bosley to give you some colour, but it's all grey at the moment, outside of you know, a small number of practitioners. But the first one that does spring to mind is um, Pete Bosley's McCann House, um, where he's used two of the three primary colours. And there's a, there's a kind of a sort of knowing little wink towards the modernism of de Stil in the, in the way that he's used it on the joinery. And then and Penny Vernon has, has added the Tavivo, which is the same palette on the bedspreads and cushions and things. And it certainly brings a, a great, you know, brightness and a kind of life and a kind of a nod towards painting, which um, one assumes that mostly it'll be painters that occupy that, that building. I always go back to first principles. It's the... It's staying true to the medium, and my medium is photography. I have this little trope that I use with students sometimes. If you, if you picture the designer sitting and thinking about a design, you've got this, the idea of, of architecture as an idea, kind of pure and perfect. It, then that idea get, gets percolated on, down to, to a two-dimensional output, like plans, elevations, um, services, drawings, little sketches. And then it gets right down to the bottom of the circle, and it's, it's got a three-dimensional expression. It's built... Um, it, the monumental thing actually exists and then the writers and the photographers turn up and we reduce it back down to a two dimensional form by publishing in a book or a magazine and it's gone flattened again and my argument is that in many ways my responsibility is to the, is to the dream at the beginning via the, via the thing that was built